okay, so I'm going to restart the second lecture. So Francis Quartieri arrived late. He said, can you do a little recap of the content of the first lecture? So I'll do it just for him. Um, so the actual content was very low, Francesco, I think most of the two minutes talks had more content than my first uh, lecture. Uh, so we discussed very general things about the, uh, the phenomenology of the glass transition, then I introduced structure factors per correlation function so that Francesco could use them in the evening, then I introduced dynamical correlation functions for density fluctuations and mean square displacements. And then we discussed a little bit the main feature of the glass transition, which is this growth of the relaxation time as the temperature is increasing. Then we argued a little bit with someone in the back whether the activation energy and the configuration and entropy were changing a lot or not so much as we approach the glass transition. And I ended with, um, I think, a description of the Gibbs uh, DiMarco explanation of the Kautzmann paradox which was based on the polymer lattice model. And um, I need to get organized. <laughs> so I'll use that space probably to, um, sorry. OK, and I think I called my uh, last chapter two simple models. So we discussed um, uh, Gip Di Marzio and the uh, recent works that tend to use polymer models as proof that there cannot be a Kautzmann transition. And so the second uh, line of uh, modeling that I would like to discuss in this uh, chapter E, which was about two simple models, is the Adam-Gibbs uh, relation. And I will be extremely brief. OK, so I recall that the dates were like this. The Kautzmann paper about the decrease of the configuration and the spectacular decrease of the configurational entropy was 1948. The gibbs di Marzio uh, polymer lattice was 10 years later, so 58, and other gibbs came in 1965. Okay. And that was the uh, final step connecting the uh, dynamical behavior of supercool liquids to the decrease of the configurational entropy. So I won't go too much into the details of uh, how they got their results. I just want to uh, uh, raise what, has, what is the, the main <coughs> physical idea. So the main physical idea that these guys have introduced is the idea of a correlation length for the structural relaxation of the system. And the uh, terminology used by these people is the idea of something I cannot pronounce. Cooperatively rearranging regions. OK, so that's too complicated. So people call this CRR. And you could think of these things as uh, just domains of particles that move together in a correlated uh, way. Okay. So the idea of Adam Gibbs is to try to have a view for the physical relaxation of particles. And they say particles in some domains of extended size C to be determined relax together to relax the structure of the system. And then comes the trick of Adam and Gibbs is to connect the configuration and entropy to uh, this uh, uh, correlation length uh, C. So what they say essentially is that they say that within these domains, you have very few states available to the system. That's why they relax together. So in a sense, you could think of a plus and minus thing. So you are in a plus state, and you, have, you go to the minus states together to relax the structure of liquid. So the, to connect to the, uh, the, to the, the dynamics to the uh, entropy, you have to think about the number of states. And the assumption that they make is that in these domains, you have a very small number of states available to the system as compared to, to the bulk system. So then they write down the configurational entropy like this. So they say the number of the system of states available to this small region, let me call it uh, omega. And if you think of plus and minus spins, this omega would be just, uh, uh, just to say plus and minus uh, two states. Okay. And so the configurational entropy would be then the entropy contained in one of these uh, domains times the, uh, the number of these domains. So I wanted to start by saying that I'm not even tired after the sailing. I realize it's too far. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally fake. Okay. <laughs> so that's the connection between the configurational entropy of the system and the correlation length that these guys uh, imagine is important for the system. And then they assume that the way the system is relaxing 
is by doing some kind of activated relaxation event in this system. So this is just a physical picture. And then you, the second hypothesis is to express the dynamics in terms of this correlation length. And then you just say that the volume inside this domain is related, uh, is uh, relaxing as a bulk. Okay, so this is the size, this is an energy scale for the relaxation of these events, and then you get the relaxation time. So I'm going very fast, the paper is a little more detailed, but this is essentially what's uh, going on. So here you have a connection between the entropy and the size of the domains, and here you have a connection between the relaxation time and this correlation length, so you can uh, remove the correlation length and then get the Adam Gibbs connection, which is the fact that the correlation time in the supercool liquid with prefactors that I don't really care, uh, let me call A here, is directly connected to the, com the total configurational entropy in the system. Okay, so this is uh, the essence of this, which is capturing this idea that I mentioned already at the beginning of the Kautzmann thing, which is trying to connect the decrease of the configurational entropy that is observed experimentally to the very uh, strong increase of the correlation time that is also ex observed experimentally. So this is the Adam Gibbs uh, connection. Okay, so that. Uh, in a sense, captures in a very uh, simple uh, mathematical way this idea of the fact that the rarefaction of metastable states is driving the slow dynamics in these uh, systems. And we'll go back to this uh, uh, connection several times in uh, the lectures. Okay, so this is the Adam Gibbs uh, model. So maybe I should mention that the number of papers trying to prove or disprove the Adam Gibbs uh, relation is probably super large and I would say it's a 50-50 you probably find as many papers saying it's totally wrong as papers saying it's totally right which is telling you that experiments alone by themselves cannot decide whether this connection is really true or wrong or just approximately true that's my view okay uh, okay so one more model I would like to mention, just at least in terms of uh, to give you the vocabulary and to give you the idea that I'm going to use uh, in the next uh, lecture. It's the idea of free volume that connects also to many of the things that uh, Andrea and you may be talking uh, about regarding this idea that uh, uh, hard spheres and jam packings may be a way to understand also the physics of uh, supercooled liquids. So the idea, there are many ways to formulate the free volume theories. Again, I don't care about the details and the specific model, but the, I would like to give you some physical idea behind this. And the physical idea, it's really the idea that dense liquids are really dense. Okay, so that's the, uh, and they are so dense that if you want to move, then it's really difficult because you're constrained by the neighbors. So the idea behind the free volume explaining the slow dynamics and the relaxation in supercool liquid is to say, if you look carefully, maybe somewhere here, you will find a little bit of volume in the system that's available to relax a little bit the particles. Okay, so the idea of the free volume is not to think in terms of what the particles are doing, but going to some sort of uh, another variable that's hidden deep into the structure of the liquid, which is the free volume available to do a structural relaxation in the system. So this idea that maybe the particles themselves are not the good way to think about dynamics, it will be an entire chapter in these lectures when I will talk about kinetically constrained models where in these models you don't really think about the particles but locations in the system where you have enough volume or freedom to do something, to have some kind of uh, dynamical activity. So. This is why I'm talking to you about the, this free volume idea. So there are many formulations of free volume, and of course, free volume is just a way to, again, predict how the relaxation time of liquids could blow up as you approach the glass transition. So in two lines, what could that be? So you could say, well, free volume is essentially, um, it's passed in the system, it's a random variable, so you express the probability to find a free volume uh, Vf as a Poissonian uh, distribution, so I will stick to my notations just for one second. So you say that you make the assumption that the free volume is distributed like this, that it's essentially uh, an exponential distribution. So this is where you find free volume in the system. 
So that's the description in the sense of the structure of the system. Then you have to think about the dynamics. Okay, I will uh, finish this and then I take your question. And then the dynamical idea behind this is, is to say, well, if I have a little bit of free volume, I can't do much. If I want to relax somewhere in the system, I have to have a large enough hole to do something like this. So the idea of um, the free volume is to say you have relaxation only if locally the free volume is larger than some threshold. You say if I have enough free volume, then I will be able to relax locally the system. Okay, so in a sense, you can also think that if you want to gather a lot of free volume at some place, you have to pick free volume from a lot of particles uh, in the neighborhood, then you have enough thing, then you can do your relaxation and the system has relaxed uh, locally. So that's uh, the idea. So because if you take this guy uh, uh, relatively large as compared to the average, then it means that the relaxation time is dominated by the smallest of the free volume. So you directly get that this is going as the exponential of uh, lambda v0 divided by the average of the f. Okay, so that's the probability to get the uh, by change notations in one minute. So that's dominated by the smallest, by the threshold. Okay, so that's the picture. You gather free volume, you have enough free volume to do the relaxation, and then you get the relaxation time. And here comes the uh, empirical modeling. Then you have to express how the average free volume is going to change with, say, the temperature if you have um, a molecular liquid, or you have to predict how the free volume is going to change with the packing fraction if you work with half spheres, and here comes the, uh, the half part of the modeling. Then you say you do lots of hand waving or just a little bit of hand waving, you don't really know. But if you predict, for instance, that the free volume is going to vanish at some temperature, then you're done because you have predicted that the relaxation time is going to grow and blow up very rapidly. Okay, so for half spheres, you would have that this guy could be something like the critical back interaction where the free volume is going to uh, zero, for instance. I mean, as I said in the first lecture, you don't really need this singularity. It's provided you put the right amount of variation of this into the exponential, you'd get the blow up of the relaxation time. I think Pierre had the question. Yeah, just a question. Do you think of the free volume as the free volume around one particle? Well, I don't think about the free volume in general, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm just trying to be very fast in the general idea. So, I, I mean, if you want to go into the 100 versions of free volume theory, we can, but that's not the goal of this uh, thing. So, for instance, if you take one of the books here, you will see that uh, you have one particle, then you have the exclu excluded volume by this particle, and what's left is, for instance, the definition of free volume. <coughs> okay, so that's uh, one way to think about the slow dynamics, and these uh, theories are very popular. They have uh, given rise to many, many uh, articles and more detailed calculations, of course, as compared to what I just uh, told you. Okay. <laughs> mm. So I have one more small chapter before going to the second lecture, really, which is uh, related to dynamic heterogeneity. Okay, so that's one page. Okay, so we just mentioned in the Adam Gibbs uh, approach or view of the physics of supercool liquid this idea that domains of particles are moving together in a correlated uh, way. And that has a very long history in the field of the glass transition. There is a book on the table, I think, that has this uh, name in the title. I don't remember the rest <coughs> of the title, but that book is telling you that lots, lots of papers have been written on this uh, topic. So I'm giving you just a few definitions and quantities that have been devised to measure 
the size of this uh, CRR, this, this uh, especially heterogeneous dynamics, and I will uh, define this function because they look very much like the two-point uh, density correlation functions I introduced in the first lecture, but they deal with the dynamics, so they, they are a little bit different, but the definitions look the same, and the physical behavior is very different. So that's uh, what this uh, one page is about. So it's about trying to define and measure the size of these uh, regions in the liquid that move in a correlated uh, way. Okay, so that's the, uh, the question. So what I told you last time is that if you take a snapshot of the liquid and you see your dense liquid and its density fluctuations, you can measure the pair correlation function or the structure factor. I don't know if I have K or Q, I don't remember. It's Fourier transform, and I told you if you look at the temperature evolution or the shape of these density fluctuations, you don't see a lot of interesting things uh, happening. Okay. So the idea behind dynamic heterogeneity is that instead of taking a snapshot of your liquid, you should watch the movie of how the particles are moving in the liquid. So to see the movie, you should start from the configuration of time zero. Okay, so this is uh, the same snapshot. So this is time zero. And I'm going to use uh, colors for where the particles arrive, say, uh, at the alpha relaxation time when the density fluctuations have started to relax uh, uh, dramatically. Okay, so maybe the particles, they have moved like this. Okay, so for each particle, then you'll have a little bit of uh, a displacement quantifying this. So this is what each particle will be doing between time zero and time uh, t. So I don't draw all the arrows because I can't see them. Okay, so each particle will have moved a little bit and if you wait long enough, the relaxation time of the system, the structure of the liquid will have uh, relaxed. Okay, so what you can define for each particle is really the displacement field at time uh, t, say, which is just Ri of zero, Ri of t minus Ri of zero. So for each particle, you attach the single uh, particle displacement. So now you can construct a displacement field of the other thing, and uh, the image is clearly telling you that the displacement field, you can take correlation functions out of this function. So let me write them, and then I will give you a sketch for you how this is looking like. Okay, so what we uh, defined last time is the self-intermediate scattering function. So we'll uh, use this as an indicator of the dynamics. Oops. Sorry. Okay, so out of this guy, I could define the quantity which uh, I killed for one minute, which is uh, exponential i q times delta ri at times t. So this is the contribution of particle i to the self-intermediate scattering function. So if I do an average over all particles of this function, you would get an average of that thing, and this is the quantity that I had called uh, self-intermediate scattering function in the first uh, lectures. Okay, so this is the average behavior. So what I can do is, this is why I introduced the tilde, I can define fi, which would be fi tilde minus the average behavior, okay? So this is the fluctuating part of this uh, quantity. So you define the instantaneous value of that thing minus the average. So this is the fluctuating part of the self-intermediate scattering function at the single particle level. Okay, so now that I have this function, I can construct a pair correlation function of that quantity. And this is the quantity that we are now getting used to call uh, G4 of R and T. And let me write it and then I comment on what it is. So it has the same form of the uh, pair correlation function, instead that now the particles are weighted by this uh, dynamical function. So, so this is theta r minus ri of zero minus rj of zero and bracket. 
Okay, so if I remove these quantities fi and fj, this is the typical, this is just the uh, per correlation function that I defined last time. But now I'm weighting uh, the position of the particle by this function, so you're looking at special correlations of the quantity fi uh, nd. Okay, so similarly, the density fluctuations, you can go to the uh, Fourier space and define the Fourier transform of that quantity, which I will call S4 of K and T, and so 1 over N, sum over I, J, F, I, T, F, J, T, exponential I, K, R, I, minus R, J, K, and then bracket. So this is this, this is a kind of uh, a structure factor. So the name of this function is called four-point correlation function. Okay, and this guy is called the four-point structure factor. Okay, and it's the same thing. It's quantifying the special correlations of uh, the dynamical relaxation. So I'll go again into my uh, sketches of the temperature and uh, behavior of this uh, thing. So the sketches, of course, I exaggerate all the features I want to see. Okay. So I told you for the pair correlation function that you had uh, something happening at uh, r equals to sigma, and then you had, whoops, Tons oscillations like this, and at long distances you lose the correlations at all. And I told you that for the for the case of the pair correlation function, you could say extract from the envelope of these oscillations some kind of correlation length. So, for instance, here you could do the same and extract the correlation length that I will call xi four, which would be the correlation length associated to these special fluctuations. Similarly, for the structure factor, so you would be in uh, K space now, and what's spiking now, it's already obvious on that sketch, that if you look at how this is looking like, this is like something like this. Okay, and so the spiking uh, features of these two functions, when measure, say, in experiments using colloidal particles or computer simulations, that these oscillations, they extend to distances that are much larger than the xi2, the density fluctuation that I mentioned before. So that's, in a sense, the striking observation is that the length scale for this dynamic uh, uh, heterogeneity, it is much larger than the typical length scale for these density fluctuations. And moreover, this quantity xi4 it does depend on t, whereas I told you that if you measure psi 2, it's essentially it's a constant. So here there is an interesting temperature dependence. Okay. So that's uh, the shape of the G4 in real space. If you go to the Fourier space, then you have this peak developing at, the, at small k. And from the shape of that peak, you could again define something like the analog of this psi 4 correlation length. And the ordering of the wave vector, uh, oh. okay, so that would be two pi divided by sigma. And the ordering of these wave vectors is again telling you that this is uh, a correlation line that extends several particles. Again, so R, R minus absolute, absolute value here? Yes. R is back to this scale. <sighs> So then it's not oh, an absolute okay. value. If I want to keep uh, vectors everywhere. Uh, so typically, so normally this is a vectorial quantity, but by isotropy, this guy will become a function of R only. So I just went too fast on this. Okay. Since uh, the uh, special correlation uh, function should be done also on some time. Uh, at which time is extracted the 
So you're right. What I mean, in in principle, you could say if I watch the movie, I can watch the movie for any length of time that mm -hmm. I have. So clearly, if the rec this time for the observation of the movie, it's super short. Then you will just see the ballistic motion mm -hmm. of the particles. So you don't expect anything really interesting in that case. Mm -hmm. If you, on the other hand, you go to super large times, each particle is going to live its own life, and then you won't find any correlation. Yes, it was, it was ECD, uh, exactly. So at long times you have nothing, at short times you have nothing. That's why I'm saying the best time to observe oh, okay. this dynamic heterogeneity is the relaxation time of the system. Okay. And again, people have studied this uh, question to death. I mean, you find in that book many studies of the time dependence of this dynamic heterogeneity. I'm trying to go super fast, and I'm okay. telling you. If you go to the time where the liquid is on the way to the relaxation, this is where it's most interesting okay. to observe which particle has moved in uh, a correlated way with some of it, the, of the neighbors. Okay. So in a sense, the quantitic cipher would tell you that this group of particles has had some kind of correlations during the relaxation over a, relaxa um, a time window to alpha, which is the relaxation time of the liquid. Okay. So by definition, if you go to delta t very small, then these quantities are one, and you're back to the, mm -hmm. the stupid, boring density correlation function that I mentioned in the first lecture. Sorry? Yes. Okay. So there are two wave vectors in those definitions. I, I wanted to hide it, but now you ask the question. So, re so remember, when we define these quantities, we say we are going to compare the single particle displacement to a typical wave vector. Okay? And I said, when this uh, distance is comparable to the wavelength that I'm probing, then this correlation function goes from 1 to 0. You didn't ask the question what wave vector was choosing at the time. But this is the same thing. Here I'm choosing one wave vector to, to observe the dynamics. So that's one uh, wave vector in these definitions. Okay. Now I'm, I'm just, for instance, I'm doing a scattering experiment that's giving me which Q I'm observing the dynamics. Okay. Now I have this quantity. You, you're right. It does depend on the, the observation, the observables I'm choosing. But now what I'm doing, I'm trying to look at special correlations of this quantity. So I'm looking at a special correlation length defined on these quantities that indeed do implicitly depend on Q. Okay, but I have an R here now. And I'm doing a Fourier transform with respect to that one to go into this K space. Okay, so this quantity here, it still depends a little bit on which uh, dynamical function I'm observing. Okay. So implicitly, you're right, there is a length scale hidden here, but this length is different from this one because this one relates to the Fourier transform with respect to this uh, R here. Okay. So now the question that you could have asked last time is what wave vector do you choose to observe the relaxation time of the system? You're not interested. It, it's your choice. It's, it really depends what uh, scattering instrument you have. Okay, so this relaxation time that I'm defining from the time decay of this uh, correlation function, it, it also depends on which wave vector I'm choosing. So we could have discussed the Q dependence of this relaxation time last time. I had a page about it, but I skipped it. And you can imagine that if you go to very low Q, the Q dependence of this will be one over Q squared because it's diffusive behavior, for instance. So these are all uh, good questions. Sorry, just one more. Um, is, are you, uh, are the, the, when you uh, plot these, uh, is that at T alpha? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's the time where you have the most interesting behavior and dysfunctions. I told you at short times, this will be essentially this one. At a large times, you go back okay. to having no correlations at all. So this is where these uh, correlations have uh, the best, um, <coughs> the most striking behavior. So the, the uh, most striking results and the most important result of all these studies, perhaps, is this idea that the correlation length that you extract from these observations of dynamic heterogeneities, it's non-trivial, it's much larger than the particle size, and it does grow rather significantly as you decrease the temperature. So the main thing 
in a sense, is the observation of a dynamical correlation length that grows as the temperature approaches uh, D. Okay, so this is the most interesting uh, uh, experimental result from all these studies. In the so that conclusion is rather firm, and probably at least it captures the idea that Adam Gibbs had in mind that as you approach the glass transition, you have these domains of particles that move in a cooperative or at least correlated uh, manner. Okay, so this is well established. That's why there are books over there. So the part of this story that's not completed is how do you go from this observation of a dynamical correlation length that you can see in the experiments in these simulations to predicting what I had called delta of T, which is the activation energy that enters the uh, description of the temperature dependence of the relaxation time. And from the knowledge of this, there is no direct way from which you can reconstruct the, correlation, the, the, the relaxation times in a sense. It's very good that we have all these uh, direct evidences for green correlation lengths, but we are still not able to infer from this a measurement of the uh, activation energy. So in a sense, it doesn't provide you with an answer to what is the origin of this super Arrhenius behavior, of this super dramatic growth of the relaxation time. This has not been uh, answered uh, directly from these uh, observations yet. Okay, so I skip all of this. I drink my tea and I go to chapter two. Going back to, to his question on the Q dependencies, if you choose the wrong value of Q, psi 4 is too small. But so can you define psi 4 as the maximum of the Q? Yeah, Q and some, some people large. have done it even in this room. So, so it's true. I mean, you're looking at the uh, structural relaxation. You have to define over which length scale you believe the structural relaxation is interesting. So typically, people would say, I take Q as 2 pi divided by K0, where K0 would be, say, the first peak of the static structure factor. That, that's one possible choice. If you go to super small distances, super large queues, probably you look at such small displacement that it's stupid. It, I mean, you don't observe the phenomenon that you want to see. You expect psi 4 to have a, a maximum for the right value of Q. So that is the yeah, well, Xi4 in itself has its own uh, subtlety, so I don't remember the exact uh, Q dependence of Xi4. If you go to Q going to zero, I think Xi4 remains finite, and it's related to the uh, diffusion constant, but uh, the length scale of uh, relaxation, I think, is self You're right, I mean, I think it has a maximum at the right value of Q. This is where you capture the structural relaxation of the system in this. So if you define a stupid uh, dynamic observable, you'll get a stupid length at the end, just to say it first. Okay, no more questions? <laughs> when questions are relaxing. Okay. Okay, so we do know from experiments and simulations that there is something like a collective phenomenon happening as we approach uh, TG, but then um, I already gave you two models for the glass transitions, and as, as I just summarized to you, there is no widely accepted explanation of what is the phenomenon or what is the best description of uh, the phenomenon of the glass transition. So in the next two lectures, I will go over two really different views of what could be behind or explaining the physics of the glass transition. So the first chapter will be dedicated to Minfield's theory, which is like an echo to what uh, Francesco will be doing over the, uh, the two weeks. I just do one lecture and a half on this, probably. And the next lecture will be a bit about kinetically constrained models, which are, in a sense, a very orthogonal view of what the physics of supercooled liquids could be. And they are nice uh, models for statistical mechanics, so that's why I also chose uh, to include the discussion of this. So chapter two, then, it's 
some kind of lecture about the mean field theory. So, so I will not repeat the same thing that Francesco uh, will be doing. I will give you a few quantities that will be of interest for the descriptions I will be giving in the fourth and fifth uh, lectures related to computer simulations and 3D observations of uh, liquids. And also these things will be useful, I think, for Francesco's lectures and at least for the, t for the seminars that you will hear also on um, sometime later, Saturday. Saturday. Okay. So I will give you just a little bit of a hint of what mean field theory is about and these guys will give you more technical details about what you can do uh, about it. Okay, so that's the, uh, the toy version of uh, the mean field theory. And so what I will do the... Uh, I will do it the simplest way. I will just take a mean field model from the outside and will tell you what's happening in this model. So you heard in the two minutes talks yesterday that several people in the room actually are working on similar models right now. So the PSP model has a very long history, but apparently it's not uh, finished. Okay, so I will not argue why this is a good model for the physics of supercooled liquids, because I don't need to do this because the justification is the lectures of uh, Francesco Innocent. Okay. So I just start from the model directly without any physical justification. Okay. So the justification will be the following. I will describe to you what's the physics of this model and the mean field, the exact mean field calculations that Francesco will be doing on hard spheres or whatever but potentially he wants to study in infinite dimensions will prove in a sense that the physics capture in large dimensions is very close to the one of this space spin model. And so that's the justification as to why this model is interesting for these lectures. Okay, so this is a spin glass model. So several things I want to mention. This is a fully connected model. Okay, so all spins are interacting with everybody. There is no geometry, hence the, na the name uh, mean field theory. There is quench disorder in the system. Okay, so people had to apologize for the quench disorder for quite a long time because they wanted to use the paste pin for super cool liquids where there is no quench disorder. So now we can avoid that discussion. And this is just uh, this uh, interactions between uh, uh, p groups uh, of atoms. So you can study the Ising version of these uh, things. I will use the version where the spins are uh, uh, continuous. So the spins they are continuous variables, and then I will introduce the spherical constraints that the sum of uh, all the spins squared is equal to n. Okay, so this is the spherical version of uh, the model. So you have to specify things about uh, the quench disorder. So you just say that the uh, coupling constants, they have average zeros and then they have a typical variance which is uh, given by the typical scaling that I take this. Okay, so the scaling with n is to give you the proper thermodynamic limit and the prefactor was just uh, the convention that everyone is using. Okay, so again, we will discuss the physics of these models and I will use it to introduce uh, the basic idea behind the uh, mean field theory of the glass transition. Okay, so I will start with uh, the dynamical behavior because that's uh, the simplest thing to do. So let's start with the dynamics of this, uh, of this guy. So we have defined the interactions of in the model. So to study the dynamics, we use, for instance, uh, the Langevin uh, uh, description of the dynamics. So we say that the derivative of the spins <coughs> are just uh, the derivative of the Hamiltonian plus random noise plus a Lagrange multiplicator for the spherical constraints. Okay, so this is a Lagrange multiplicator. To get the spherical constraint. <coughs> so I'm not jet lag, but I feel I'm jet lag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should feel that everything is moving. It's not. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the random noise, and it has the same properties that. Uh, <coughs> okay, so this is just to ensure that the value that someone equilibrium. Okay, so that's the definition of the dynamics. This is the Langevin dynamics of the spins in this uh, Hamiltonian. Okay, so we'll do it uh, very, very, very quickly. So it's on all the books about the mean field theory and about the spherical space spin. So I will assume that the system is at equilibrium. Okay, so I will assume that the temperature is large enough that we are not yet deep into any interesting glass uh, region. <coughs> So in equilibrium, it turns out that if you study this dynamics, due to the fully connected nature of, uh, of the system, then you can write down an exact equation for the evolution of this uh, correlation function. Okay, so if you define the spin spin sort of correlation function, because the system is mean field, then you can derive an exact equation of motion for this correlation function and it's closed and it's, uh, it's all there is. Okay. So let me write this down to you, then you have uh, an idea of how it's looking like. Okay, so it's an integral differential equation that looks uh, like this. Okay, so it's way simpler than some of the dynamical equations that you had on some of the slides uh, yesterday. Or mean field the house field. Okay. okay, so you have one degree of freedom, which is this uh, correlation function that describes the relaxation of the system. And the dynamical equation is really a closed equation, so it's an integral differential equation. So if I give you the initial condition, which due to the spherical constraint is one. So this is just an uh, a differential equation, so you get the solution for all uh, positive times. It's just given by the solution of this equation. And this is just the power of P minus one of the same correlation function. So it's closed on its side. Okay. So it's giving you the entire physical uh, dynamics of the system. Okay, so you can try to solve this analytically in some of the uh, large time limits or you can solve this easily on the computer numerically if you want to see the detailed uh, shape of the system. So I don't know which one I do uh, first. So I give you the solution first and then I describe what it is. Okay, okay so if you look at say the numerical simulations of this uh, dynamics as a function again of the log of times because we will be observing the glass transition. So all these correlation functions, they start from one. So if you have a system at high temperature, you essentially see something like uh, uh, an exponential decay. And then if you decrease the temperature, you see the emergence of a two-step decay like this. And then you decrease a little bit the temperature and really, really bad something like this. So that's for the regime. And then there will come a temperature below which you see no relaxation of the system. Like this. So you see the emergence <coughs> of a dynamical transition. So this uh, dynamical transition, I will call it TD. And these temperatures will be for temperatures larger than uh, TD. So this is how the correlation functions look like. And they look like the ugly sketch I gave you yesterday for super cool liquids. That's why um, sketches are interesting. And so the main feature of this is emergence of the slow dynamics is uh, strongly diverging during relaxation time. The well-defined dynamical transitions below which the correlation function doesn't decay uh, to zero. So the system becomes uh, non-ergodic. Okay, so the system is non-ergodic. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'll do the solution as in the review paper on the table uh, at the back. So the only calculations I will do about these uh, dynamical equations is trying to understand the emergence of this non-trivial uh, large time limit as the temperature crosses uh, TV. Okay, so the system becomes non-ergodic when the correlation function does not decay to zero. So it will decay to some finite value, which I'm going to call uh, Q for these calculations. So if you take the large time limits of this equation and you introduce the idea that the correlation functions at long time goes to a constant Q, then this is what you get. You get that the derivative is zero, then you have the minus T <coughs> Q term that comes here, and then you can do the integral by is q p minus one and then you have a one q minus one here so i just take the large time limits assuming that i have a non-zero uh, value for the correlation function at large times okay so you can just rewrite this a little bit so it's q one minus q is p divided by two square q to the p minus one okay And the way that I would like to use to, to find a solution for this is to introduce the potential V of Q because I'm going to use it uh, uh, later. So let me define V of Q as T integral between 0 and Q of this difference. So it's Q 1 minus Q <coughs> minus P divided by 2 square times Q P minus 1. Okay. And so the solutions of this equation are given by dv by dq equals to zero. Okay, to find the solutions. So let me write this potential explicitly by doing the integral. So it's minus q minus log one minus q minus q to the p divided by two to the square. So that's uh, the explicit form of the potential. So what I would like to discuss is the shape of this potential. So again, if you take this function and you try to plot its uh, behavior, you don't have blue anymore. Here. Thanks. Okay. So this is the shape. Oh. This is the shape of this potential V of Q and the function of Q. Okay, so it goes between 0 and 1, and I'm going to describe just the approach to this dynamical transition. <coughs> so this is how T looks like larger than TD, and you find the emergence of the secondary minimum at the dynamical transition. Okay, and this is how the, this is looking like. So again, the solution of these equations are given by the minima of the Q. So at high temperature, you only have one uh, solution for the equation, which is at Q equals to zero. Okay, so this is the solution at high temperature. Okay, and you have the emergence of the second solution at T equals to three. So this is what I want to comment So if you look for the Q dependence, the temperature dependence of this uh, uh, Q, it means that at TV, Q is jumping discontinuously and it has some kind of singularity. discontinuous emergence <laughs> of a Q of T yeah. like this. Yes, it's discontinuous. Okay, so I mean you can call it whatever I'm just saying your Q is discontinuous at the transition, so you can call it a first order transition. But it's a dynamical equation, so it's oh, not okay. <coughs> um, 
Okay, so this is what the Dynamics is uh, giving you. And if you study in more details the shape of these correlation functions and the relaxation time as you approach the dynamical transition, then you find that at long time these correlation functions they decay. <coughs> Well, you can put an exponent here, beta, which would be relatively trivial for the base spin model, but for some uh, maybe more complicated base spin models, this guy could be uh, slightly smaller than one. But the key feature, of course, is that the relaxation time here is diverging as a power law of the distance to um, the dynamical transition. So you have a power law increase of the divergence of the relaxation time at the dynamical transition. So you have at least emergence of a two-step decay, discontinuous dec dec increase of a plateau, and power law divergence of the relaxation time at the dynamical transition. So this is what the physics, what the dynamics of this space spin model is looking like. <coughs> okay. So here I will do, I will echo just a little bit the uh, first slide that Francesco has used uh, yesterday about the history about the mean field theory of the glass transition. So I erased the dynamical equation, but as Francesco mentioned, I don't have the specific date for these things, but from the early uh, 80s and later on, the work on the bad coupling theory of the transition The so-called mud coupling theory of the glass transition uh, was was uh, developed. So I, I'm not sure if anyone is going to go into how you get the uh, uh, equations of motion for the dynamics of liquids. But you could say that it's an approximate closure. So it's a kind of mean field theory if you want for <coughs> dynamical <coughs> equations. Uh, for liquids. Okay, so the details of the derivations, I'm not too interested, but the type of um, <coughs> approximations that are the, that were made to derive this mud coupling theory, they give rise to a dynamical equation that look like this. So I used, I think, Q. Okay, the same wave vector that I have introduced later. And this is the type, or at least the form of this uh, um, dynamical equations that mud coupling theory is uh, <coughs> is deriving. Okay, so I will have to translate everything in Q because I'm using Q from the beginning for no reason. Okay, so here the starting point is really uh, a description of the liquid. So you start from liquid state theory and then you write down the microscopic <coughs> evolution for the density fluctuations and you do some uh, ugly approximations and you end up with equations of motions that look like this. Okay, where I won't write it down because I don't have enough space, but the function m, it's really a function of the static structure factor that I define and the same function fq Okay, so I, I won't write down what the functional form of M, it's too complicated. And this guy is really the structure factor. And this guy is really the intermediate scattering function. Okay, so the relaxation of density uh, fluctuation. Okay. So this equation is nice because it's closed again on two point density functions both for the structure and for the dynamics of the liquid. So again, if I give you the initial conditions, you can solve these equations numerically and get the solutions for what would be the dynamics of a liquid. And you have the whole Q and time dependence of uh, these dynamics. And the only reason why I wrote down these equations is that it should be obvious that the mathematical form of this equation, of the mud coupling equations for the dynamics of liquid it's the very same functional, or it's the very same type of uh, 
integral differential equation that uh, are obeyed for the dynamics of the base spin model. So this is the coincidence that Francesco mentioned in his very first slide, bet this collision of theories between these mean field spin glass dynamics and all these groups of people that were trying to derive closed equations for the dynamics of liquids and then realized that the dynamical equations they were getting were very similar in the two cases. So because the functional forms and the form of the equations are the same, if I sketch again the solutions of mode coupling equations for, say, Leonard Jones liquids, you'll find the two-step decay, the stress exponentials, the power law divergence of the relaxation time, the discontinuous emergence of a plateau in this correlation functions, everything that I said for the dynamics of the base spin model would be true for the mode coupling equations for dense uh, liquid. So it's the very same physics uh, uh, happening and the very same dynamics uh, taking place uh, there. So hence this idea that the mode coupling theory for liquids could be something like a mean field theory for the dynamics of liquids. And this is, I think, where Francisco is going to discuss um, in more detail this connection. And you've seen yesterday, the, I think, in one of the two minutes talk by Alessandro, you saw the uh, dynamical equations for our spheres in large dimensions. They don't have quite this shape, but if you remember the sketch of the correlation functions that come out from his numerical integration, it's very similar. You have this two-step decay, the divergence and the relaxation time that grow. So the physics is really, again, uh, very similar. So I'm getting lost in my pages and trying to away. OK, so that's uh, for dynamics in the P-spin model. So what about uh, statics a little bit uh, now? And these are the next two pages. Sorry, before you raise it, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, can you just explain again the motivation for defining V of Q? Because I get that you can define that Q Yeah, has you, some you could have gone the solution because uh, it's going to come back in. Uh, four pages. Okay. So that's the motivation. <laughs> that's it. Okay. <coughs> so what I'm going to do next is describe the uh, thermodynamics and the, the statics of this uh, mean field sp sorry, uh, spin glass models. And one of the quantities that I would like to introduce to also look at the thermodynamic properties is a kind of potential that's called V of Q, that's called the Franz Parisi potential, and we'll have exactly that shape. Okay, so that's why I introduced it in the context of the dynamics, precisely to make the connection between dynamics and uh, static later. Okay. Okay. So what about thermodynamic properties? And the key idea is. Metastable states. Okay, so a large group of people got excited about the PSPIN model, and many people, including the people in this room, are very much interested in trying to understand the properties of uh, the phase space of the PSPIN model, and in particular, this idea that because uh, you have a disordered systems, you have many. Uh, metastable states emerging in the system, you have a rugged uh, free energy landscape. And so after all these years of hard studies, people have really come to the conclusion that if you look at uh, the free energy of the P-spin model, and you look at the properties of the free energies and the free energy landscape in the model, so the one key feature is that, again, uh, emerges from these studies, and I don't know what Francisco is going to do about it, about hard spheres, is the apparition of an exponentially large number, large number of metastable states. Okay, so it means if you define the free energy of the system and you look for the minimum of the free energy, you'll find a very large number of the solutions. 
Okay, so that gives you the idea and that quantifies in a sense and that and make it mathematically valid this idea that in supercooled liquids you have many amorphous states available to the system. So all of this can be quantified and computed uh, very precisely uh, in the p speed model. So there are so many of these uh, solutions to minima of the free energy that you have to introduce a function to quantify that number. And so the function is like this. So if you if you compute the number of uh, metastable states at a given level of a free energy, you find, as I said, an exponentially large number. And then if I have an exponential, I introduce something which is called the sigma, which is the complexity. Okay. So that's called the complexity in the language of uh, the P-spin model, but it's really uh, the log, one over n, the log of the number of solutions of uh, free energy, for the number of free energy minima. So it's really like a configuration of entropy. Okay. So what I call configurational entropy in the first lecture was a way to quantify experimentally how many distinct amorphous states were available to the system. I told you how experimentally think and try to measure uh, that quantity. So in the context of the P-spin model, you can really do that calculations, try to find the number of uh, minima of the free energy, count them, and you realize that that number uh, is exponentially large in N, so that you can define this entropy, which is called the complexity in the context of the P-spin model. I could call it the configuration and entropy. And that's really one of the main physical feature of this uh, physics. Okay? So when you do these calculations, and uh, you find, again, many review papers trying to do and describing these calculations. So this is the outcome of the calculation. So this is how this complexity is looking like. You don't find uh, states and uh, this uh, exponentially large number of states of, uh, for any value of the free energy, but it's confined to some <coughs> range of values. So you have a minimal value here, typically, and then you have a maximal value above which you do not find uh, this uh, large number. So, but there is an entire range of free energy values over which uh, you can find this uh, non-zero complexity or configurational entropy. Okay. So that's the outcome of uh, hard studies of the free energy landscape of the p spin model. Okay, so this is true for the p spin model. Again. Okay. So here I go if you want to construct the thermodynamics of this system. So if you want to construct the thermodynamics. Okay, so I'll just do a few lines. So you write down the partition functions like this. So you would say I would sum uh, the partition function like this. Okay, and I will say that the partition function can then be decomposed over <coughs> a sum over all metastable states. So So this is how I decompose the phase space uh, of the system. And then I can introduce the complexity. <coughs> in a way that I'm going to use three times in the lectures of the world. Okay, so I can rewrite this thing by introducing that the complexity, so I go like this, delta, and then I introduce delta function. Okay, so this is just a one. Okay, so this is just a one. So I haven't done anything, but what I'm going to do is going to exchange that thing just to see the emergence of the complexity. I did nothing up to now. But because of the delta function, I can put an f here. And this is, by definition, uh, related to the complexity of exponential sum of f. Okay, so just 
The pedestrian way to rewrite the partition function like this, minus n beta, where you have sigma of f here, minus f minus p sigma. Okay, so I did nothing but rewrite the partition function using the idea that I have this exponential number on meta zero. So this is the way to rewrite the partition function as an integral over the free energy. Okay, because I have an n here, I can use the side of current approximation. Okay, so the uh, dominating term of this uh, integral will be then when this guy uh, is maximum. So the saddle point then uh, will be given so 1 over t will be d sigma by the f. I feel like a super cool liquid and I'm going slower and slower. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if I take the free energy, so I take minus beta n um, just to define the free energy. So this is the equilibrium free energy and then the free energy will be just this f star minus t. Okay, so this is the equilibrium free energy uh, of the system. So the free energy then result from this uh, competition between this exponentially large number of states that want to uh, push the free energy one way and this free energy which is going this way. So you have a competition between, between, uh, between F and T sigma that gives you the equilibrium free energy. Okay, so this is uh, like this. So the solution of the saddle point equation is typically what uh, we show. So if you want to see uh, at which level of the free energy you uh, end up here, then the construction is like this, that this is the curve of sigma versus F, and the derivative should be related to one over T. So graphically, the saddle point equation is like this. So if you're lucky and the temperature has the right uh, thing, so this is I'm going to use colors. So this is a straight line of slope one over t, and when it equals the derivative of sigma of f, then this is the solution of the saddle point equation. Okay, so this is f star. The temperature t, okay. and then that number is giving you the solution of the saddle point approximation. So it means that depending on the value of t, you can find a solution. Or if the slope is too large or the slope is too small, then you won't find any solution. So if you go to that pictorially, the solution for the temperature evolution. Of sigma would be something like this. So if the temperature is too large, then the slope is too small, and then you above you find no solution. So it would be uh, like this. Then there is a temperature that happened to coincide with the dynamical one, where you start to find one solution like this, and so you find one solution here. So this is slope one of a TD. And then the complexity emerges, it's decreasing a little bit, and then there is a second temperature here that I will call Tk, where the configuration and entropy vanishes. Okay, and below you find the solution again. So from the solution of the saddle point equation, this is the temperature dependence of uh, the complexity or the configurational entropy in uh, the PESPIN model. So you, you find three, in a sense, uh, different phases. Uh, so I don't remember what colors I used. Anyway, I don't have a black. So, 
so, so this is the high temperature liquid where you don't find metastable states uh, uh, and the system is just a simple uh, liquid. Then you have a regime where you have this exponential number of states that dominate the physics. And then there comes a second temperature that we didn't see in the uh, dynamical equation where the complexity is vanishing and you don't find uh, any metastable states anymore. So this is a kind of entropy crisis or if you want to use this is a kind of Kautzmann transition. Okay. This is where this configuration of entropy is going to zero. So it means that at t below tk, you have a zero configurational entropy. It means you have a sub-extensive number of metastable states available to the system. Okay. Okay, so the conclusion of this is that what you have, uh, first of all, is like a, a realization of the Kaltzman Okay, so remember that when I told you about the Kaltzman transition, I said Kaltzman took data. We were discussing the validity of uh, discussing this excess entropy, and then Kaltzman had to extrapolate to guess about the possible existence of a Kaltzman transition where the configuration of entropy would go to zero. In the context of the PSPIN model, this is all well defined. We know what we are computing. We are computing the complexity <coughs> of the system, this number of uh, metastable states. So this is a well-defined quantity, and we don't have to extrapolate anything to say that it's going to be uh, zero at tk. So the mean field uh, theory of the glass transition, in a sense, it's exactly really realizing the scenario that Kotzman uh, had in mind. So that's the first thing. So it seems then, okay. so the scenario for the glass transition in mean field is then like this that I'm, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to plot vertically, but you have this uh, two temperature scale, which I call TD and TK. So above TD, the system is a liquid. Okay, so the thermodynamics of the system is relatively simple. And what we've seen is that if you measure the relaxation time of the system, then it's diverging like this. Okay. So this is what the dynamics is doing. So as you approach the dynamical glass transition, the dynamics slows down. And the relaxation time in this phase is truly infinite. It means that in that regime, which is dominated by uh, metastable states, The dynamics is already frozen, even though the thermodynamic transition is already only taking place at uh, TK. Okay, so this is the region where the uh, configurational entropy uh, is defined. Okay, so sigma is doing something like this. Okay, so at least this is uh, the scenario of the thermodynamics and the dynamics uh, in the uh, mean field limit. I do those two pages. So I skip one section to finish and I will answer his question then. So. 
Okay, so we introduced this function v of q in the context of uh, the static. So I had another thing about the uh, the method to compute the complexity, <coughs> which is due to uh, Monasson, but I think Francesco is going to do it next week. So I, I don't do anything about uh, Monasson. It's, so it's all on uh, you. So, okay, so the idea that I skipped was the idea to use the replica calculations to compute uh, the complexity. So in the Franz Parisi potential, we also use a little bit the idea of replicas, clones, copies of the system, but we take only uh, two copies of the system, okay? So we take a configuration that I will talk, uh, that I will call uh, S hat, so it's uh, um, the value of the spins in the context of the P-spin model, so this is, a reference, an equilibrium reference configuration. Okay, from equilibrium. So we take one reference configuration and we take it, and then we take a copy of the system, <coughs> and we call the copy S. So we have two configurations, one is the reference one and one is uh, S. So by S, I just mean S1, S2, S3, Sn. So just the configuration of the system. Okay. So we define these two things. And what we do in the Franz Parisi potential and is we add a coupling between the copies. Okay. And we add a coupling which is such that when the coupling is strong, the two copies want to have the same uh, value. So we want the spins to be very similar in the two copies of the system. Okay, so the way that I'm going to do this is by introducing this partition function just to follow my notation. So it's a partition function that depends on the reference configurations. The coupling between the copies, I will call it uh, epsilon. And this will, of course, depend on temperature. And so the uh, statistical physics that I want to do with the system S will be the Hamiltonian of the system S, so that's the base spin model. And what I want to do is add a coupling that forcing the system to look uh, very similar. So I will introduce this quantity Q, which is the overlap between the two copies. So this is the overlap between S hat and S. Okay, so for the P spin model, the overlap would just, <coughs> just be the, the scalar product of the spins, so some of our S, uh, some of our I, S I in copy S times S I in copy uh, S hat. Okay, so for if you want to generalize this for liquids, then you would get the overlap that I introduced in lecture one for density uh, correlation functions. But this is the P spin model, so it's much simpler. It's just the the, um, the projection of the spins onto the reference configuration. So let me write down the free energy averaged over the reference configuration. And then we talk about the transparency potential. Okay, so what I was doing here was doing the thermodynamics of the system S for a given reference configuration. When I have done this, I can compute the free energy of that system. So I can compute the log of z that I call log of z s hat epsilon and t. And once I have done this, then I can do another average over the reference configuration. And then I would get the free energy for a given epsilon and for a given t. So I just write this one. So I do a second average over the reference configuration, this time taken for this, and then I average this. Okay, so I'm doing the uh, double average. So I first do the thermodynamics of one, and then I do an average over reference configuration. Okay, so that's giving me a free energy as a function of f uh, and t. And as we heard uh, many, many times, what I want to do is I want to move from <coughs> epsilon to Q, because this is the quantity that I would like to compute, which is the free energy in uh, Q space. 
Wataito is Aito, a legend transform. Okay, so this is like changing uh, magnetization for a uh, magnetic field. Okay, so I go to V of Q and T, and I just give you directly to go faster to lunch, to dinner. The definition of V of Q that I will be using. I'm doing this just to connect to the dynamics first and to show you and to introduce methods that I will uh, use later in the context of uh, computer simulations to compute uh, this quantity. Okay, so if I go to the free energy expressed in terms of uh, Q uh, and temperature, this is uh, what I get. So I get this free energy that expresses the, the free energy cost to have uh, fluctuations of Q that are large. So there are two ways that we like to think about this V of Q for a given temperature, either we think about it as a free energy, or we think about the PDF of Q, that is the probability distribution functions to observe uh, fluctuations of Q. Okay. And because this is the free energy, then the connection between the free energy and the fluctuations of the other parameter is like this. So this is a large deviation function just to use the uh, the names of the first lecture. So I'm going to come to the definition that I want for this uh, free energy V of Q. So you can think about it as the log of the PDF of the overlap. So you can think about measuring the fluctuations of the, uh, I change notations again. So this is Q, so this is Q. The overlap between the reference configurations and the reference uh, thing. So I do my thermodynamics uh, for the system S, like this. Okay, so this is my first part, and then I take the log to go to the free energy, and then I do the average over the quench disorder. Okay, so this is my definition of the Franz Parisi potential. I hope I have all the factors uh, right. Okay, so if you compute, if you do this calculation of the Franz Parisi potential in the P-spin model, which is where I think this calculation was done uh, in the first place, this is the behavior that you see at different temperatures. So I sketch it again, and I hope uh, that will answer uh, the question I had before. So if you start from high temperature, you get a V of Q that has essentially no interesting shape. So this is again t larger than td, and then if you go to td, you see the emergence of this minimum. And then for temperatures below td, you see this secondary minimum, and for temperatures approaching tk, then you see that this secondary minimum is going to touch uh, zero. Okay, so that's uh, what it is. So the uh, interesting feature, there are many interesting features of this potential, so you recognize the shape of that thing. And if you think of the temperature regime, which is in between uh, Td and uh, Tk, and if you think of that uh, free energy difference between the solution at Q equals to zero and the secondary minimum here at Q, uh, I think Benjamin likes to call it Q glass. So if you think about the free energy difference between Q0 and the secondary minimum here, so let's say 
let me call it V of Q glass minus V of Q equals zero. So this is the free energy of the system constrained to be in a given state minus the system at Q equals to zero, so minus the equilibrium free energy. Okay, this. And I told you that this guy is F star minus T sigma. <coughs> Okay, so this free energy difference here that I will call delta V is directly related to uh, the complexity of the system. Okay, so what, what, what does it all mean? So this uh, quantity is telling you how much free energy you have to pay to have an overlap uh, Q different from zero. So in the high temperature liquid, the fluctuations of the overlap will be concentrated on Q equals to zero. What V of Q is telling you is what is the probability to observe unlikely fluctuations of uh, the overlap. They're exponentially suppressed in N, so this is a large deviation function. And this free energy has this uh, typical behavior. So if you want to localize the system at finite Q here, you have to pay some free energy in this high temperature regime. And the free energy cost that you have to pay is typically given by uh, the complexity. So that's the why this. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the transparency potential is um, interesting. So I will use this again when I will come to uh, practical measurements of the, the configuration analytics. Okay. And maybe one more thing just to uh, close the loop with uh, one of the posters that you've seen yesterday. I will draw one phase diagram to conclude and then I'm done. Okay, so we discussed the behavior of uh, the Franz Parisi potential, but I introduced earlier the idea of a coupling between the two copies of the system. So I will just uh, uh, finish with this phase diagram. So assume now that you put an epsilon to zero, so real coupling between the reference configuration and the um, uh, and the configuration you're studying. So what you will be effectively doing. So this is the fluctuations of Q in the absence of the epsilon between uh, uh, the two copies. So if you introduce an epsilon between the, so you will favor high values of Q. So what you will effectively do, you will tilt this potential towards large Q. And when you have a system that has a metastable state here, you tilt it by an external field, you will be able to induce the phase transition between these two states. Okay, so epsilon going to zero is going to tilt the Franz Parisi potential. And in the region where we are approaching uh, TK and this Q, uh, finite Q solution is barely metastable with respect to the Q equals to zero solution, we can induce the phase transition like this. So again, if you do this calculation, this is the phase diagram that you find. So now if you extend this with the finite coupling, so I told you about these two transitions at TD and at TK that are characterizing the system at the epsilon equals to zero. But we saw that just above TK, the glass solution at finite Q, it is just metastable with respect to the, uh, the liquid. So the phase transition that happens at TK then is becoming a line of first order transition. Okay. By tilting the potential, you can induce the, the, the transition towards a finite Q at a higher temperature as compared to TK. And if you follow back this solution, you see that it's going to disappear with a singularity here. So this line of first order transition, it is ending here at a critical point with a critical temperature and a critical value of uh, TC. So what you have is the Kautzmann transition, which is followed by this line of first order transition, which ends at the critical point above which you have no longer any transition because the free energy is very smooth at high temperatures. Okay, so this is uh, the phase diagram that uh, Benjamin yesterday has presented in his uh, two minute talk about his poster. So you have all the details regarding the transition in his poster. Okay, so we can see uh, later about it. So I close here for today. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? In this
picture? What happens when you go T below TK? Um, so to do the calculations of Z of Q below TK, I don't know, you would have to... Uh, so what, what's happening is that T, uh, T below TK, the complexity sticks to zero. So I told you that you have emergence of the metastable state, it goes to zero at TK, and then it, go, it stays zero here. So it means essentially, well, this secondary minimum is staying here. So what's happening at TK is two things. If you want to, sorry. If you want to think about this uh, free energy difference, again, let me do this. So it emerges at TD and it vanishes at TK. Okay, and it stays zero here. So yeah. in terms of the behavior of this quantity that I called, uh, and I should have marked it in red, but I lost red. Okay, so that quantity was T sigma. So this guy is going to zero and it stays zero. So the quantity that I call sigma, it stays zero below TK. So the quantity which is, uh, sorry to interrupt, the quantity which is, wh what solution in Q is dominating as a function of temperature? It would be something like this. Okay, so the Q versus T. So it would be zero, which is the global minimum for all temperatures above TK. And then at TK, you will jump to a finite value of Q like this. So ah. in a sense, you have a discontinuous jump of the average overlap between things. That, that makes sense. So the, this curve may go below, but the, there's just no solution to that. Uh, I asked Francisco 100 times, what is V of Q below TK? How does it look like? It sticks to the secondary minimum. And anything interesting here, uh, like it goes to zero, I don't remember. But the, okay. I don't know. people don't use it below TK, I think. Um, so uh, when we did the um, dynamics of the correlation function and um, got some relation for little q, yes. and that sort of turned into V of q, so if we had solved this <coughs> fully using the Hamiltonians, would we have gotten that same expression for? Well, it's mm -hmm. Yes and no. I mean, we, we, we took a look and a few days ago with uh, Benjamin Presley, we discussed about it. So if you want to solve for V of Q, it, it's way more complicated than for the dynamics. Mm -hmm. okay. And part of the calculations here involve replica symmetric breaking. Right. So what, when I'm saying, well, you do this and this and this, it's not that obvious to do it. You have to do the calculation, minimize the free energy, introduce replicas, break replica symmetry breaking, and you have pieces of V of Q where you have to break uh, replica symmetry breaking. Okay. okay, so it means V of Q becomes a function of uh, many more parameters as compared to Q, and you have to minimize all of this. And in some uh, high temperature simplified uh, replica symmetric limit, the stationary points of V of Q get you to the equation for the dynamical equation. So the connection between this one the dynamical one, it exists, but it's a bit uh, okay. um, tedious. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Thank you again.